In our first episode, we explore historical perspectives on the universe and how they were perceived in ancient times. In this second episode, we'll delve into the concepts of space and time, specifically addressing the question of whether they are absolute or relative in nature. We will also investigate the prevailing scientific viewpoints on this matter, exploring how contemporary scientists interpret the fundamental properties of space and time. Are space and time intricately connected? Let's begin our journey through the historical evolution of our comprehension of space, time, and motion. The evolution of our understanding of the motion of objects in the field of science can be traced back to the works of early scientists like Galileo and Newton. Prior to their contributions, the prevailing belief, influenced by Aristotle, was that an object's natural state was at rest, and it would only move if a force or impulse was applied to it. According to this Aristotelian tradition, heavier objects were thought to fall faster than lighter ones because they were believed to have a stronger attraction to the Earth. Aristotle's ideas also included the concept that one could deduce all the laws governing the universe through pure thought and logical reasoning without the need for experimental observation. Consequently, there was little effort made to empirically verify these assumptions until Galileo's time. Although the popular tale of Galileo dropping weights from the Leaning Tower of Pisa is likely apocryphal, he did conduct an equivalent experiment. Galileo rolled balls of different weights down a smooth slope to investigate the motion of objects. This approach was more manageable for observation than vertical free falls because the speeds involved were lower. Galileo's experiments on rolling objects down slopes provided significant insights. He found that regardless of their weight, each object increased its speed at the same rate. Imagine you have two objects, a heavy bowling ball and a lighter tennis ball. Now, let's place them on a gentle slope, like a ramp, and release them from the same height. Here's what you'd observe. The heavy bowling ball and the lighter tennis ball will both start rolling down the slope at the same time. As they roll down, you'll notice that they both pick up speed at the same rate. It's like they're in a race, and they're both running at the same pace. After one second, both balls will have the same speed. Let's say it's one meter per second. After two seconds, they will both be going at two meters per second. This pattern continues, so after three seconds, they'll be at three meters per second, and so on. What Galileo's experiments showed is that the weight or mass of the objects doesn't matter when it comes to how they accelerate while rolling down a slope. Whether it's a heavy object like a bowling ball or a lighter one like a tennis ball, they both speed up at the same rate. This concept was a significant discovery in our understanding of motion and how gravity affects objects. It means that in a vacuum or a place with very little air resistance, all objects fall at the same rate, just like the bowling ball and tennis ball on the slope. This held true for objects of varying weights. When air resistance is not a significant factor, like with two different lead weights, they fall at the same rate. To further illustrate the point, on the Moon, where there is no significant air resistance, astronaut David R. Scott performed an experiment with a feather and a lead weight. Well, in my left hand I have a, a feather, in my right hand a hammer. And I guess one of the reasons uh, we got here today was because of a gentleman named Galileo a long time ago, who made a rather significant discovery about falling objects in gravity fields. And we thought that uh, where would be a better place to confirm his uh, findings than on the moon? And uh, so we thought we'd try it here for you. Uh, the feather happens to be appropriately a falcon feather for our falcon. And I'll uh, drop the two of them here and hopefully they'll hit the ground at the same time. How about that? Mr. Galileo was correct in his findings. And they indeed hit the lunar surface at the same time, confirming the universality of this principle. Galileo's findings were critical in the development of Newton's laws of motion, which were published in Principia Mathematica in 1687. Newton's first law of motion, often referred to as the law of inertia, states that an object at rest will remain at rest and an object in motion will continue moving in a straight line at a constant speed unless acted upon by an external force. In other words, an object will not change its state of motion, speed or direction, unless a force is applied to it. Galileo's experiments demonstrated this concept because he observed that objects rolling down a slope continued to increase in speed, demonstrating that an external force, gravity, was acting on them. 
This was a significant departure from Aristotle's belief that an object's natural state was at rest. This observation challenged the prevailing notion that the sole purpose of a force was to set an object in motion. Newton's second law of motion deals with what happens to an object when a force is applied to it. According to this law, the acceleration of an object is directly proportional to the force applied to it and inversely proportional to its mass. In simple terms, if you apply a force to an object, it will accelerate, and the amount of acceleration is determined by how strong the force is. If you double the force, the acceleration will also double. However, if the object is heavier, it will accelerate more slowly for the same applied force. This relationship is mathematically expressed as F equal ma, where F is the force, m is the mass of the object, and a is the acceleration it experiences. To illustrate this concept, think about a car. A car with a more powerful engine can accelerate faster because it can exert a greater force. This is why you might feel a noticeable difference in how quickly a small, light car accelerates compared to a larger, heavier one, even if they have the same engine. In addition to the laws of motion, Newton's third law of motion is another essential part of Sir Isaac Newton's laws that fundamentally shape our understanding of how objects interact. This law is often stated as for every action, there is an equal and opposite reaction. Newton's third law deals with the interaction between two objects. It states that when one object exerts a force on another object, the action, the second object exerts an equal force in the opposite direction on the first object, the reaction, this action-reaction pair of forces is always equal in magnitude, but acts in opposite directions. To understand this law, it's crucial to recognize that forces occur in pairs. For example, when you sit in a chair, your body exerts a downward force on the chair due to gravity. In response, the chair exerts an equal and opposite upward force on your body. These two forces make up an action-reaction pair. Newton's third law is evident in many everyday situations. Like when you walk, you push backward on the ground with your foot, action, and the ground pushes your foot forward, reaction, propelling you forward. When you swim, you push the water behind you, action, and the water pushes you forward, reaction. This law is closely related to the conservation of momentum. When the action and reaction forces occur, they result in changes in momentum for both objects. However, because the forces are equal and opposite, the changes in momentum cancel each other out. This means that the total momentum of the system remains constant. It is a crucial factor in understanding how objects stay in equilibrium. When you stand on the ground, the force of gravity pulls you downward, your weight, and the ground exerts an equal and opposite force, the normal force that keeps you from accelerating into the ground. These forces balance each other, and you remain stationary. This law has numerous practical applications in engineering from designing vehicles and machinery to understanding how rockets work in space exploration. Engineers and scientists use this law to design and analyze systems where forces are at play. Sir Isaac Newton also formulated the law of universal gravitation, which states that every object with mass attracts every other object with mass through a force called gravity. This force is directly proportional to the product of the masses of the two objects, and inversely proportional to the square of the distance between their centers. Mathematically, it is expressed as F equals g m1 m2 by r squared, where F represents the gravitational force. G is the gravitational constant, a universal constant of proportionality whose value is 6.67 times 10 to the power of negative 11. m1 and m2 are the masses of the two objects. R is the distance between the centers of the two objects. One of the key aspects of this law is that the gravitational force is directly proportional to the masses of the objects involved. If you double the mass of one object, the gravitational force it exerts on another object will also double. The other critical aspect is the inverse square relationship with distance. The force of gravity weakens as you move farther away from the object. If you double the distance between two objects, the gravitational force becomes one-fourth of its original strength. This is why gravity becomes weaker as you move away from the Earth's surface or any massive object. Newton's law of universal gravitation is called universal because it applies to all objects with mass. It doesn't matter whether the objects are large or small, and it's not limited to just Earth. It applies throughout the entire universe. This is why it's called universal. This law had a profound impact on our understanding of the natural world. 
It explained why objects fall to the ground, the motion of celestial bodies like planets and moons, and the behavior of objects in space. It unified the physics of motion on Earth and in the heavens. For instance, it's the same law that governs both the motion of apples falling from trees and the orbit of the moon around the Earth. The insight that all objects fall at the same rate when under the influence of gravity is a crucial consequence of this law. While heavier objects experience a stronger gravitational force, they also have more mass. According to Newton's second law of motion, the mass of an object affects how it responds to a force. Heavier objects resist changes in motion, but the gravitational force they experience is stronger. These two factors precisely balance each other, resulting in the same acceleration for all objects in a gravitational field. This is why, as famously demonstrated by Galileo's experiments and the Apollo moon landing, objects of different masses fall at the same rate when dropped in a vacuum. The difference between Aristotle's ideas and those of Galileo and Newton concerning the concept of a preferred state of rest is a fundamental shift in our understanding of motion and the nature of the universe. Aristotle held the belief that every object naturally tended to come to rest. In his view, if you rolled a ball along the ground, it would eventually stop moving because its natural state was one of rest. He also believed that the Earth occupied a special and unique position in the universe, being at rest at the center of it. This geocentric view of the universe was a prevailing belief in ancient times and dominated scientific thought for centuries. I recommend watching part one for additional details. According to Aristotle's ideas, if an object was in motion, it was because an external force or impulse had been applied to it. Without such a force, everything would be at rest. Galileo's experiments challenged Aristotle's notion. He found that objects, regardless of their weight, increase their speed at the same rate when subjected to the force of gravity. This implies that objects in motion tend to stay in motion unless acted upon by a force, and objects at rest remain at rest unless a force is applied. This was a departure from Aristotle's view. Newton's laws of motion expanded on Galileo's observations. His first law, often called the law of inertia, states that an object will maintain its state of motion, whether at rest or in motion, unless a net external force is applied. In other words, there is no preferred state of rest, and the natural state of an object is to continue in its current state of motion. This perspective also extends to the concept of reference frames. In Newton's view, there is no absolute standard of rest. One can equally claim that a stationary object is at rest while another object is in motion relative to it, or vice versa. This implies that all motion is relative, and there is no fixed point of reference in the universe. Let's illustrate this concept with some easy examples. Imagine you're on a train traveling north at a constant speed. If you look around inside the train, everything appears stationary relative to you. You might feel like you're at rest inside the train. Now, let's consider someone standing outside the train, observing it from the platform. From their perspective, the train is indeed in motion, moving north. This example emphasizes that the concept of being at rest or in motion is relative and depends on your frame of reference. It's similar to when you're on a moving train or in a car. Inside, you might not feel the motion, but an observer outside would see the vehicle moving. The key idea here is that there is no unique or absolute standard of rest, and all motion is relative to the observer's point of view. Crucially, all of Newton's laws, including those governing the motion of objects, hold true whether we consider the Earth at rest or in motion. This means that the laws of physics are consistent in both reference frames. This lack of an absolute standard of rest implies that one cannot definitively determine if two events that occurred at different times happened in the same position in space. Here's an easy example to illustrate the concept of relative motion and reference frames. Imagine you're on a train that's moving smoothly in one direction and there's a ball bouncing straight up and down on a table inside the train. As you watch the ball from inside the moving train, you see it bouncing up and down at a fixed spot on the table, and the time between bounces is one second. However, someone standing outside the train on a stationary platform is observing the same ball. From their perspective, they see the ball bouncing up and down, but they also notice that the entire train is moving forward as it travels down the tracks. To the person on the stationary platform, they would perceive the two bounces of the ball as occurring about 40 meters apart because the train has traveled the distance during the one-second gap between bounces. 
This example highlights the idea that the position of events and the distances between them can appear differently depending on your frame of reference. There is no single preferred frame of reference and all motion is relative to how an observer is moving or at rest relative to the situation. Newton formulated the laws of motion and gravitation, as we discussed earlier. However, he held a belief in the existence of absolute space. Absolute space, in Newton's view, was a fixed and unchanging reference frame against which all motion could be measured. This concept was tied to his idea of an absolute god, a divine being who provided the fixed framework for the universe. Newton's belief in absolute space clashed with the emerging concept that there was no unique standard of rest, as proposed by Galileo and later incorporated into his own laws of motion. The philosopher Bishop Berkeley was one of the critics of Newton's notion of absolute space. He argued that all material objects, space, and time were, in fact, illusions. Berkeley's perspective challenged the existence of an absolute, unchanging framework for the universe. Dr. Johnson rejected Berkeley's ideas in a somewhat humorous manner. Johnson's response was to kick a stone. By doing so, he highlighted the tangible reality of the material world. This act of kicking a stone was meant to demonstrate that the physical world, including the objects in it, had a palpable existence, regardless of philosophical debates about the nature of reality. In other words, Johnson was emphasizing the empirical and practical aspects of the physical world, both Aristotle and Newton shared the belief in the existence of absolute time. They considered time to be an independent and unchanging entity, separate from the physical world and consistent for all observers. Time, in their view, was entirely separate from and independent of space, which aligns with common sense notions. This concept of absolute time had a significant influence on the development of classical physics and our understanding of the nature of time. To explore why time consistently moves in a single direction, you can refer to our video discussing the concept of the arrow of time. However, this classical understanding of time and space had limitations, especially when dealing with objects traveling at or near the speed of light. The finite speed of light was first discovered by the Danish astronomer Ole Christensen Roma in 1676. He made a groundbreaking observation related to the timing of eclipses on Jupiter's moons. These moons were known to orbit Jupiter, and their eclipses were a predictable astronomical event. He noticed that the timing of these eclipses was not as consistent as one would expect if the moons orbited Jupiter at a constant rate. Instead, there was a variation in the timing of the eclipses. He attributed this variation to the changing distance between Earth and Jupiter as they both orbited the Sun. When Earth was farther from Jupiter in its orbit, the eclipses appeared to occur later than when Earth was closer to Jupiter. He thinks that this delay in the timing of eclipses is due to the finite speed of light. Light from Jupiter's moons took time to travel to Earth. And when the distance between the two planets increased, it took longer for the light to reach us. This observation was a significant milestone in understanding the nature of light and marked the first direct measurement of the finite speed of light. His calculated speed of light was not very accurate by modern standards, as he estimated it to be about 140,000 miles per second. In reality, the speed of light is approximately 186,000 miles per second, or about 299,792,458 meters per second. Despite its lack of precision, Roma's work paved the way for further investigations into the nature of light and its speed, eventually leading to a more accurate determination of the speed of light. This provided evidence that light does not travel instantaneously, but has a finite speed. And this understanding had far-reaching implications in the development of modern physics. A comprehensive theory of the propagation of light didn't emerge until 1865, when the British physicist James Clerk Maxwell successfully unified the existing partial theories of electricity and magnetism into what is known as Maxwell's equations. These equations predicted the existence of wave-like disturbances in the combined electromagnetic field, which would travel at a fixed speed, akin to ripples on a pond. The speed at which these waves traveled turned out to be the speed of light. It was a significant breakthrough. However, this revelation raised a fundamental question. Newton's classical theory had done away with the notion of absolute rest, which meant that if light was to travel at a fixed speed, there had to be a reference point against which that speed could be measured. 
Passage marks a transition from the classical Newtonian understanding of physics to the more complex and nuanced understanding brought about by Maxwell's work, which laid the foundation for the theory of electromagnetic waves and ultimately led to the development of modern physics. In the past, scientists introduced a concept known as ether in an attempt to explain how light travels through space. The ether was envisioned as a hypothetical substance that was believed to permeate all of space, including what appeared to be empty space. Scientists proposed the ether as a medium that filled the entire universe. It was thought to be a substance that allowed light to travel through space, just as air allows sound waves to propagate. In other words, light waves needed the ether to move. According to this concept, the speed of light was expected to be relative to the motion of the ether. This meant that the speed of light would appear different to observers who were in motion relative to the ether. Despite the expected differences in the perceived speed of light from moving observers, the concept maintained that the speed of light, as measured relative to the ether, would always remain constant. In other words, the speed of light relative to the ether would always remain constant, regardless of the motion of the observer or the source of light. The idea of the ether was introduced to address the question of how light could travel through the supposedly empty space of the universe. However, it led to some challenges and inconsistencies, particularly when scientists tried to detect the motion of the Earth through this hypothetical ether. In the context of the concept of the ether and the Earth's motion through space, there was an expectation that the speed of light would vary depending on the direction of the observer's motion relative to the source of light, this idea is best explained in the following scenario. Imagine the Earth orbiting the Sun. As it moves through space, it carries the observer along with it. The observer is located on Earth and is conducting experiments to measure the speed of light coming from a distant source, such as a star, in different directions. When the observer is moving in a direction that takes them closer to the source of light, for example, moving toward the star, it was expected that they would measure the speed of light to be faster than when they are at rest relative to the source. In contrast, when the observer is moving at right angles to the direction of the source of light, not directly toward or away from it, it was expected that they would measure the speed of light to be slower compared to when they are at rest relative to the source. This expectation was based on the classical understanding of the ether, where the ether was considered a medium through which light traveled, the motion of the Earth through the ether was believed to affect the speed of light as measured by the observer, with the speed being influenced by the direction of the Earth's motion relative to the source of light. However, the Michelson-Morley experiment, conducted in 1887, demonstrated that the speed of light remained the same regardless of the direction of motion or the Earth's orbit. This unexpected result challenged the classical concept of the ether and played a significant role. In this experiment, Albert Michelson and Edward Morley set out to test the concept of the ether. Their experiment was designed to compare the speed of light in two different directions. One aligned with the Earth's motion through space, the direction of its orbit around the Sun, and the other at right angles to this motion. The expectation was that the speed of light would vary depending on these directions due to the Earth's motion through the ether. However, the results of the Michelson-Morley experiment were astonishing. They found that the speeds of light in both directions were precisely the same, without any observable difference. This was a direct contradiction to the prevailing belief that the motion of the Earth through the ether would affect the speed of light. The implications of this result were profound. It challenged the classical understanding of the ether as a medium for light transmission, and led to the rejection of this concept. The Michelson-Morley experiment played a crucial role in shaping the new paradigm introduced by Albert Einstein's theory of special relativity. Einstein's theory proposed that the speed of light is constant for all observers, regardless of their motion, and that space and time are interconnected in ways that were previously unimagined. The theory of special relativity revolutionized our understanding of the universe, introducing concepts like time dilation and the equivalence of mass and energy that is, E equals mc squared. It discarded the idea of an absolute reference frame and paved the way for modern physics, changing our understanding of space, time, and the fundamental principles of the physical world. In essence, the Michelson-Morley experiment marked the beginning of a new era in physics, challenging classical notions and opening the door to a deeper and more accurate understanding of the universe. 
the introduction of the general theory of relativity by Albert Einstein in 1915 marked a pivotal moment in the history of physics. It not only transformed our understanding of space and time, but also revolutionized our perception of the universe itself. This theory introduces the revolutionary idea that space and time are dynamic, interconnected entities influenced by the presence of mass and energy. This shift in perspective gave rise to a dynamic universe, challenging the traditional notion of an infinitely static cosmos and laying the groundwork for groundbreaking insights into the universe's finite origins and possible destiny. In next episode, we will explore the profound implications of Einstein's theory and its enduring impact on our understanding of the cosmos. <laughs>